गुड मर्निंग पीजी डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जियोग्राफी आशुतोष कॉलेज इन कोलैबोरेशन विद आईटीएससी इज गोइंग टू ऑर्गेनाइज टू डे स्पेशल लेक्चर वी शुड कन्वे आवर थैंक्स टू द अथॉरिटी ऑफ आशुतोष कॉलेज वाइस प्रिंसिपल सर वर्सेस सर आईटीएससी कोऑर्डिनेटर मैडम फॉर देयर इंटेंसिव कोऑपरेशन टू ऑर्गेनाइज सच अ ऑनलाइन इवेंट on behalf of department of geography ashutosh college kolkata myself shubodip gupta welcome you all in today's special lecture entitled key concepts in geomorphology geomorphology the study of earth surface processes and history is an integrative discipline as geomorphologist we strive to make sense of the complicated wave of interactions shaping mountains and valleys moving sediments and water down slope and changing the shape of continents and ocean basins throughout the millennia a deep understanding of geomorphology requires not only the expertise in solid earth geology but also the ability to use principles of physics chemistry biology and mathematics to understand the earth surface processes and the evolution of topography over short and long time scale geomorphology is also an applied science one that saw people and societies the world over geomorphologists identify geologic hazards provide information and effective land management and are trained to understand the linked process that produce and erode the soil on which agriculture and the civilization depends without the geomorphologist it is not possible for us to at least mark the flood prone area drought prone area landslide prone area who should help the road builders to identify the stable terrain who should understand the river dynamics or coastal dynamics and to protect the inhabitants living there so the nature of mutual connection between earth surface process and earth surface form has lain at the heart of geomorphological discourse the language in which geomorphologists have expressed these connections has altered with changing cultural social and scientific context in very broad terms a qualitative approach begun by classical thinkers and traceable through the mid 20th century preceded a qualitative approach now several kinds of approach are available in geomorphological domain process response approach a landform evolution approach an approach that focuses on the characterizing of landform and landform system environmental sensitive approach etc so with this brief note i am going to the next stage of today's program now it's my pleasure to welcome our honorable iqc coordinator madam to say something of today's event thank you shubodip thank you shubodip good morning everyone on behalf of the iqc ashutosh college i welcome our distinguished speaker for today we the members of ashutosh college are always striving to enlighten the minds of our students with knowledge and as a part of this journey today's seminar is just a step in the right direction we are aware that geomorphology is the study of landforms and the study involves looking at the study of landscapes to work out how the earth surface possesses such as the air water and ice and how they could mold the landscape as we are all aware the cataclysmic climate changes that are occurring in the past few decades have an immense impact on the landscape and hence the topic that has been chosen for today i suppose is both pertinent and relevant for our students i extend my best wishes to the department senior faculty members and also our dear colleagues and also wish them a grand success for today's event thank you so much for having me over to you shubhadeep thank you thank you sipanandi thank you so much now is the time to me to welcome our senior most faculty 
PG convener as well as governing body member of our college, Dr. Shaini Mukherjee, to say a few words as introductory note. Didi. Good morning. Good morning, all of you. On behalf of Ashutosh College, it is actually my privilege and pleasure uh, to welcome the esteemed speaker, Professor Ramkrishna Maiti, and all the participants to this webinar on key concepts in geomorphology organized by, the, by my own department, uh, that is Department of Geography, in association with IQSC Ashutosh College. And with much pride, I would like to add that the speaker is my batchmate, extremely humble and learned person. I have personally, I have learned many things from him. And Ashutosh College, uh, that is the outcome from the dream of Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee, the visionary that materialized on 17th of July 1916, has now reached the centennial milestone with nearly about um, 6,000 students, almost 250 faculty members, uh, 180 non-teaching staff members involved in the teaching learning process in more than 28 uh, subjects, including undergraduate, postgraduate diploma certificate, BVOC community college, and add-on course. And Department of Geography is a very pride possession of Ashutosh College, not only of Kolkata, but also of West Bengal and Eastern India. The department has uh, started its undergraduate journey in, in the year of uh, 1946, and PG course was started in the year 2009. And on completion of uh, 10 years of our PG department, uh, studies, we have started this series of invited lecture series and today we have privilege to have Professor Maiti with us and who is a renowned geographer, especially in the field of advanced geomorphology and um, geographical philosophy. Uh, he has done his work in many such fields of mining, environment, slope instability, embankment beaching, flood and its social impacts, mechanism of real gully development, prospects of regional development, surface water budget, watershed management, and so on. And without wasting many time, I again welcome uh, our sincere thanks and gratitude to the esteemed speaker for joining us. And I believe that we all, our students and our faculties, we all will be enriched from his valuable lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Maiti. Thank you, Madam, for your valuable kind words. Now, let me introduce today's speaker. Ramkrishna Maiti. Professor Ramkrishna Maiti is a very popular face in the periphery, not only in geomorphology, but also in the arena of philosophy of geography, in the entire philosophy of geography. Dr. Ramkrishna Maiti presently serves with the Shagar University in the post of professor in the Department of Geography. Before joining with the Shagar University in 2004, Dr. Maiti served Kashyan College for one year and Darjeeling Government College for three years under West Bengal Education Services, WBES. He completed four research projects sponsored by University Grant Commission and Indian Council for Social Science Research. Till now, he has successfully guided 13 PhD theses and 3 MPhil theses. 3 PhD theses are under process. Presently, 8 PhD scholars are working under his guidance. Dr. Maithi authored 4 textbooks, which are very popular among geographers in West Bengal as well as India. He co-authored 6 reference books, 3 from Springer, 1 from Primus Books, New Delhi, 2 from Lambert Academic Publication, Germany. He edited one book on biodiversity atlas in Vidyashagar University campus 2019, Vidyashagar University, Vidyapur. He published about 85 articles in national and international journals of repute, including reputed publishers like Elsevier, Swinger, and Taylor and Francis, and 15 articles in conference proceeding. Professor Maithi delivered more than 140 lectures in national and international platform. He is associated with a number of professional associations like Indian Science Congress, Kolkata, Geographical Society in India, Kolkata, Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, IIRS, Diradun, 
Institute of Landscape Ecology and Acoustics, ILI, Kolkata, Indian Association of Hydrologists, National Institute of Hydrology, Roorkee. Professor Maiti is attached with large number of universities and higher academic institutes of West Bengal, as well as India, in the important academic assignments and responsibilities. So with this brief description of our resource person today, I transfer the stage to Professor Maiti. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Shuhudip Gupta, Shuhudip, and uh, Dr. Shayani Mukhavadha for your nice introduction and, and uh, nice words about me. So I don't know uh, how far I am uh, say, able to justify your, your, your introduction. I, I, I'll try to uh, share my uh, thought in the, in the uh, area of fundamental concepts, that is the key concepts in geomorphology. And in this, uh, in, the, in the outset, I uh, am thankful to the college authority, IQAC Ashutosh College, for inviting me in, in, in such, a, such a valuable lecture and, and giving me this platform for, for share my views. So, so please bear with me. Let me share my uh, PowerPoint first. Is it visible? Shubhadeep? Yes, sir. I, visible, sir. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, key concepts in geophilology, it's very important for the students and researchers of geomorphology because uh, geomorphology today has been expanded into a wider domain. So, starting from planetary geomorphology, Fluvial geomorphology, glacial geomorphology, anthropogeomorphology, there are, there are lots of subdisciplines under geomorphology itself. So, and then social geomorphology also, urban geomorphology also. So, so there are wide areas in which geomorphologists are working. And, and the research and teaching learning in geomorphology are so complex today. So that there, 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 there uh, should have uh, there, there, there should be some fundamental concepts or key concepts or organizing concepts that will help us to understand the total area of work, the the the, the uh, fields in which uh, geomorphological understanding are expanded and the way we should uh, explain the geomorphological understanding. So these key concepts or organizing concepts help us to organize entire domain of our work and the complexity in teaching, learning, and research works. So these are the unifying concepts. I have selected five concepts which will help us in understanding the geomorphic process and forms. The first one is scale dependency in geomorphic process and forms. How, how the geomorphic processes, working of geomorphic processes and development of landforms are, are scale dependent. There are two scales we know, the spatial scale and temporal scale, and how, how all those geomorphic processes and developing landforms are, are interrelated with those spatial and temporal skills. The first one, the second one is the process and landscape, process and forms are, are, are interrelated while they are acting together. But in most cases, what we found, what we find that the process controls landscape. So far we understood that every geomorphic process develops its own set of landforms. But today we will see how the landscapes are generated by themselves, how they are self-regulatory in systems. 
Okay, and this could be this could be explained by the principle of conservation of energy and conservation of mass. Then this conservation of mass is a, within within a time unit t is very important to understand the nature of nature of transfer of materials from one place to other. You know, you know, geomorphic processes are actively transferring mass and energy from one part of the earth surface to other so all the all the all the evolution of landscapes are related to this transfer of materials so understanding the conservation of mass within a special unit during a time unit t is is, is a very very important idea then rule of transport how the materials are being transported how the materials are being transported and what are the principles behind those transport of materials is the rule of transport and these are mainly related to physics and we are we are we are as as you know geomorphology is more uh, say, say close to the physics principles of physics and we are using those theories and 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 uh, algorithms of physics but we don't know about the about the basic principles so 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 we should we should know those uh, principles better for uh, their their better applications and the last one is how the geomorphic processes are thresholded every day geomorphic processes don't work they start working after crossing a threshold crossing a critical conditions so this understanding of geomorphic threshold is very important and today i selected these five five unifying concepts which will which will set our understanding for a better explanation of process and geomorphic forms so let us start with scale dependency of geomorphology how the geomorphological process and land forms we know there are the geomorphic there are the close relation between process and forms fluvial process develops its own set of land forms eolian process develops its own set of land forms so this is our basic understanding about the process form relationship okay now you see there are land forms of various scales varied scales so this is a small scale land forms sediment small sediment rills or sedimentary structures within a within a drainage basin these are a very small scale land forms and these land forms develop and destroys within days or months or even just after a after a uh, say say a flood or after a cyclone these uh, small landscapes uh, land forms are developed and and then it is destroyed within a days or a months and again 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 after a, after a storm event they are again started so in this way in this way the small scale land forms are being being formed and changed within a very small a short period of time now if we come to the river process river process are uh, spread over a larger spatial area and those river processes change within some months or even a year within within a year the, the river landscapes fluvial landscapes are being changed as their spatial dimension is large it covers spatial dimension is large spatial dimension is large here it it covers few hundred meters 2 kilometers and and its temporal dimension or temporal framework is also longer then regional landslide say it also it also covers a large area it covers large area hundreds of square kilometer area and this landslide occurs at an at, at a interval of 100 100 or or, or say, say hundreds of uh, so so tens of hundreds of years okay now if we come to the glaciation glaciation covers thousands of square kilometer areas thousands of square kilometer areas it covers and it occurs at an interval of 
one or 1.5 million years. So, 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 as the spatial scale increases, spatial coverage, coverage increases, its temporal dimension or temporal coverage also increases. So, larger landscape takes longer time to develop and redevelop. Mountain building, it covers hundreds or thousands of square kilometer areas and it takes millions or hundreds of million years to, to, to uh, say, say, originate and to destroy. Okay, So this is how the, the process and landforms of different spatial scales, different spatial scales are linked with different temporal scales. Okay. If we go to the coastal system, coastal areas, if we come to the coast, then this, this, this linkage would be much, much, much clear to us. Say so castlate. This is a very small scale landscape, landform, and it it it, it has a spacing the, between two castlate, there is a distance between zero to three meter. And what is the time span, response time? minute to hours, within some minutes, within few minutes or within few hours, it is created and destroyed. Then cusps, a larger landscape, it looks like a cusp plate, but it has a larger dimension, cusp, 3 to 30 meters spacing, and it takes hours or days to, to, to create and destroy. Then sand wave has a spacing of 100 to 3 kilometers, 100 meter to 3 kilometers. We know the sand wave coastal areas, the sand dunes, sand dunes. And it, it takes weeks or years to develop and redevelop. Then secondary cape, one kilometer to 100 kilometers spacing it has. And it, it, it takes decades of period, decades of time for, for its creation and destructions. Primary cape, at least 200 kilometers apart, and they take centuries time period, time, centuries, uh, say a long time for, for their creations and destructions. So it would be clear for you. Yes, these are the these are the small scale land, say landforms of say reels, uh, sorry, sorry, these are the uh, swastmaks. These are the swastmaks. And it has a, a, it has a spacing of few centimeter to meter and it, it creates and destroys within hours. Then small ripples, centimeter to meters, uh, say uh, dimensions, very small scale landscape, and it takes hours. You will, you will see uh, the ripples are developed on the beach, and after a few hours, you see there these were these were destroyed. So during high tide and low tide, their creation and and destructions are linked within within this temporal period of tidal limits. So, if we come to the castlet, these are the castlets, small cusps and horn topography. Those are developed. Those are the, those are the medium scale land, landforms. A uh, few few meters of their spacing, and they develop and redevelop within a period of hours and days. Then beach, beach is a much larger landscape. They develop, they develop within years, within years. They develop and destroy within years because their extension is far, far, far larger, a few hundred meters to kilometer. Then if you see the delta, delta covers hundreds of square kilometer areas and it takes decades, few decades or a or, or, uh, few hundreds of years for their creations and destructions. Secondary caves, secondary caves of hundreds of square kilometer uh, extension and spacing and they takes decades or centuries for their for their creations and destructions. Then primary cave, those are far apart, far apart, 200 or 300 kilometers apart, and they take centuries or hundreds of centuries for, for their creations and, and destructions. So this is how, how, the, how the process and form, geomorphic forms, are, are interlinked with spatial dimensions and temporal uh, temporal skills, spatial and temporal skills. So why this understanding is required? Because, because if you like to do research on a particular landscape or particular process, 
then you have to understand what is its spatial dimension and accordingly you have to select your time frame for research say if you if you uh, take entire delta for your say gonga delta for your for your research areas and if you take only 5 years of time span for its understanding for the process form relationship so this small period of time would be very insufficient to understand what is the process form relationships going on in a, in such a larger landscape okay so so this is how this understanding of scale dependency is very important now i am taking one practical example of a of a say dennis basin say it's a, it's a very small basin but i am taking it as a as a miniature form of a larger uh, river basins say if you concentrate on a channel bed say it's a channel bed this channel bed or a small channel changed within to changes within within a instantaneous time period of single storm one single storm can make a remarkable change within this channel okay but if you take a reach entire reach say lower reach upper reach middle reach then if you take a reach then 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 this reach changes within years or decades of years and and entire catchment changes within few decades or or, or hundreds of years is required for for change in the in this entire catchment so this is how this is how our spatial understanding and temporal understanding in geomorphic process and forms relationship is very important okay so how does a single channel change in a single storm say this is a channel you, you see the skyline you see the skyline and you will see so this is a particular channel we have we have monitored for long time so it is uh, on this particular day of 2009 channel was like this in 2010 channel is changed 2011 channel is changed so this is how this is how a single channel is changed in response to a particular storm of a particular year so channel lengthening channel widening width of the channel has been remarkably changed uh, after after a after a particular storm okay and valley deepening also valley deepening on a particular date you see the dates and the the the, the nature of the depth of the valley are various geomorphic dimensions geometric dimensions of the channel how 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 those are being changed in response to different storms and entire morphology of the channel has been changed after a particular storm okay so this is how this is how one channel responds to a particular storm that means it's the instantaneous instantaneous time period so if you study or if you if you concentrate your study on the channels that means every storm is important for you so you have to monitor the channel in every storm every every storm but if you if you if you fix your study area on a particular reach particular reach then then your time period may not be so so, so short you can take a long time scale i have taken one example of rupnarayan river rupnarayan river it's a small reach after shilabuti joins darukeshwar river rupnarayan river forms so this is the rupnarayan river and it's very important because it carries the drainage of a larger catchment area the drainage of damodar darukeshwar shilabuti and kangshabuti mainly passes through this through this catchment area so this has a regional importance if 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 this channel of rupnarayan is clogged it choked with sediment then or loses its drainage capacity so there will be the drainage congestion during rainy season in this upper catchment and this area would be, would have a potentiality to be flooded okay potentially potentiality of flood in this region will increase if any change occurs in this uh, small reach so in such a study Uh, so, so this reach has been monitored for few years. So this is how the entire drainage system of this uh, region 
is carried by carried by this reach of Rupnarayan River. So Rupnarayan River was how it was in 1973, how it was in 1990, how it was in the year 2000, and how it was in 2016. You see, almost entire part of the Rupnarayan River has been sedimented. So it 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 loses its drainage capacity, and thus the upper reach. Uh, of Ghatal, Dashpur, Arambagh, is is we become prone to prone to prone to uh, say say flood. So to understand to have this understanding on the change of this river, uh, uh, change of this uh, river reach, then we have to take at least a decade of one decade or two decades of time frame. So our research or our understanding or our uh, analysis was concentrated for a, for, a, for a time period of decades. Okay. Now, if we come to the rich skill studies, you see, you see the lower reach of Damodar, if we, uh, 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 Ganga, if we take this lower reach of Ganga, then there are lots of change after, after we constructed numbers of reservoirs and dam in, in, in the upper courses of those tributaries, mainly the right hand tributaries like like Damodar, uh, Mohiraksi, Kamsabuti. And what is its impact in its in its lower courses? In its lower courses, especially in the in the in the uh, Ganga Delta. If you understand these things, so these are the Tilaya, Maithon, Panchet, and lots of and Kamsabuti Dam. Numbers of dams you see, those are those are constructed in the decades of 1950s and 60s. Okay. And you see now, most of those reservoirs are, have, have lost their drainage capacity or water holding capacity by extensive sedimentations. That means those sediment which are which are previously carried to the downstream, to the estuary for replenishment of this Ganga Delta or for the for the nourishment of Ganga Delta couldn't reach to this. To this estuary, those are arrested within these upper courses. Okay, and as a result, what happened? You see, so together those dams has has uh, stored one five six six million tons of sediments, and and you see the drainage sediment concentration also is very less at this B point. So this is the B point. This is the sediment concentration curve. At this B point, sediment concentration is too less, too less. And that's why, that's why much of the regions, much of the southern tips of Gonga Delta has, has transferred into erosion prone. Okay, due to the sediment deficiency, Due to the sediment deficiency, Ganga Delta has becoming erosion prone as most of the sediments are being trapped inside or at the upper catchment by, by the, the construction of large dams. So to have this understanding, we had to wait for at least five decades. The impacts were not so prominent previously, but now that impact is is, is is becoming prominent. Okay. Yes, seventy five percent coastal areas of India and Sundarbans are, are are in a state of severe erosion due to misbalance between sediment availability and its demand to fill the accommodation space. There are huge accommodation space because of because of sinking of delta and sea level rise. So to compensate these two processes, huge amount of sediment is required, but, but there is no availability of sediment. There is very limited availability of sediment as most of the sediments are being trapped inside. Okay, that's why Sundarban is turned into a erosion prone delta. That delta couldn't, couldn't proceed into the sea and delta growth has been interrupted. So to have this understanding, we had to wait for at least 40 to 50 years. 
because it covers a large area it covers a large area so if you your study area covers a large area then your timeline for the research should be long but if you concentrate on a smaller special unit you have to concentrate on single storm or a single monsoon single season so this is how this is how your understanding of the scale dependency is very important for the geomorphic study and geomorphic understanding okay i think the first 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 key concept that i like to address is is clear to me now if we come to the second one self regulatory nature of the landscape we will try to understand process form relationship every geomorphic process develops its own characteristic landforms fluvial process one set of landforms are developed eolian process another set of landform glacial process develops another set of landforms if you see a landform then you can identify which process is responsible for it so from this point of view from this point or from this from this understanding we can establish the relation between process and form that means process controls the landforms process develops the landforms so landforms are guided by the processes okay now now we will think in the in a different way different line so this is the hypothesis process control landforms processes control landform and landform in turn controls the nature and effectiveness of processes so it seemed to be funny because we we don't get this uh, understanding in the popular textbook or popular popular uh, lectures or uh, popular writings but if you think from a from a different perspective from from a from a sorry scientific perspective then the thing should be uh, clear to you say this is a landscape this is a landform it is its height and this height and it is the slope it is the height and it is the slope you know the slope and height slope or gradient then this height regulates its potential energy you know the potential energy could be calculated by the formula mass gravity and height m into g into h mass gravity and height and this height is this height okay now when the materials are set in motion say water when water moves when when sediment moves when glacier moves when wind moves then this potential energy is transferred into kinetic energy and this kinetic energy is the only available energy that 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 works so it is the available energy for working for transportation for say entrainment or erosion and for transportation so this kinetic energy is the only energy which works okay now how how does this potential energy is transferred into kinetic energy how via this slope the slope regulates the rate of this change between from potential energy to kinetic energy height regulates the potential energy and slope regulates its kinetic energy so this height and slope is the character of this landscape is the character of this landscape this height regulates its potential energy how much energy is stored due to its position here and how much energy is transferred to kinetic energy or how much energy is available for working is regulated by this slope so this topographic slope sets the erosional potential or erosive potential of the landscape whether there will be erosion whether there will be transportation or there would be deposition depends upon this slope 
instead of this steep slope if there is gentle one then energy would be much less here okay so how much energy is available for it depends upon both this height and slope and this height and slope are the character of what character of this landscape so landscape regulates how much energy is available on it for the working and we know the working depends upon the availability of energy if much energy is available there is erosion if moderate energy is available there is only transportation of the eroded materials if less energy is available there will be deposition so where there will be erosion there will be transportation or deposition depends upon the availability of energy which is regulated by the height and slope of this landscape only so this landscape dictates where there would be erosion and where there would be deposition and where there would be transportation if we see the landscape here there are the high slope is high height is more height is maximum and slope is steep so there is erosion over here and over here as the height is less and slope is moderate there is only transportation here and at its bottom there is much deposition due to due to much lowering of height and slope so there is deposition here transportation over here and erosion over here so the evolution of this landscape or 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 change of this landscape are regulated by the character of this landscape only so landscape shaping is guided by the local variation of height and slope here height is more slope is more that's why there is erosion and there is much change of the landscape over here so where there would be erosion where there would be deposition is controlled by the landforms themselves so we have to think in a different way from a scientific perspective and this perspective is guided by the rule of conservation of energy here potential energy is developed by the mass and height and this potential energy is transferred into kinetic energy and this kinetic energy is available for work only and if you keep this relationship in your mind then 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 this understanding will be clear to you and thus a landscape is self regulatory system landscape is self regulatory system how much change on a landscape is expected depends upon depends upon the character of that landscapes distribution of slope and height of that landscape only i think this is clear to you intensity of process is controlled by the distribution of height and slope yes so far we understood process controls the landscape now we will see how far the process is controlled by the distribution of height and slope or process is controlled by the character of landscape okay now we are coming to the third concept of conservation of mass conservation of mass it's very important for a geomorphologist because the present research areas the the, the contemporary research is of geomorphology is 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 uh, guided by this principle of conservation of mass so earth surface processes we have already discussed are only transferring materials mass from the source to sea from the source areas from himalayas to the ganga delta to the estuary so everywhere 
there is the transfer of materials from one region to other, from higher, higher elevation to lower elevation, according to the gradient. Okay, and and then materials are being transferred means the landscapes are being changed. So this is a very fundamental understanding of geomorphic processes. Okay. That means landscapes are being changed by the transfer of materials from the so from source to sink. And what is this principle? Within a within a landscape unit, if we consider it as a landscape unit, within a landscape unit, within a time period t, input minus output would be equal to would be equal to the change in the storage. There is a storage of mass here, within here, within this landscape. Some sediments are being deposited here. And whether this sediment or this deposit will increase or decrease depends upon the relationship between input and output. Output through the mouth. In a river basin, there is the output of water and sediment through the river basin, through the through, through the through the mouth of the river basin. And if this output of water is more than the input, then there will be water scarcity. If the output is less than the input, there will be much storage, positive storage of water, flood occurs. Okay. So everywhere, everywhere, this principle of conservation of mass is being applied. And to understand this, we constructed a constructed a reservoir for understanding these relationships of input and output. And what is the change in the stories of water and sediment in its in its lower catchment? And this principle of conservation of mass is being used for constructing sediment budget in a river basin, from con for constructing water budget in a, in a watershed or river basin, for conservation of water in overland flow, whether there is much input than the output, and what is the relationship between input and output of overland flow? and flood conditions, conservation of water in groundwater field also, what's the relation between recharge and discharge of the groundwater, and what is the, what is the uh, say, say, uh, state of change in the groundwater storage, we do it. Conservation of water in flood discharge calculation, volume of ice in a glacier, there is fresh inclusion of ice on the glacier, and there is melting of glacier, ablation of glaciers. So, what is the relation between this input and this output? Gives you the health of the glaciers, whether there is positive health or negative health. Okay? Conservation of sediment in a bed form profile. In a, in a river basin, there are the bed forms, there are the sediments, and what is the amount of sediment which are locked on the, on the, in, in those bed forms? Is there any positive change in the in the sediment volume or negative change? Depends upon this conservation of conservation of mass. Conservation of sediment in a littoral cell in the coastal areas. How much sediment is being supplied from, from, the, from the terrestrial regions, from the land, and by a by a longshore current? Gives you the sediment budget in a, in a particular area and it gives you. The, the character, erosional character or depositional character of a coast. So, so, so the present areas of research is mainly guided by this principle of conservation of mass. We try to understand this, this, this principle of conservation of mass by constructing some plots. So, five plots were constructed. Five plots were constructed to understand the precipitation discharge relationship and role of vegetation in output, input output relationship or temporary storage 
within the within those plots so these are the plots those are five plots which are constructed and which are constantly monitored in every 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 rain so there are the vegetations there are the vegetations somewhere there is the 20% vegetation somewhere 40% vegetation somewhere 60% 80% and 100% vegetation so in this way the vegetation cover changes vegetation cover changed and we we monitor it we maintain it and we monitor the uh, rains rains of those days at least 24 days of uh, rainfall were monitored their uh, amount total amount and duration was uh, say, say recorded in with a, with a rain gauge and their intensity average intensity was calculated and in plot 1 plot 1 has the vegetation cover of 100% plot 2 has the vegetation cover of 80% plot 5 has the vegetation cover of 20% rainfall 5 mm 1 hour duration okay so the rainfall unit input input in cubic meter would be like this and volume of discharge differs volume of discharge and volume of sediment differs among those plots because of the variation of vegetation cover on a single day on a single day so this is how this is how we try to understand how how the input output relationships are there in original condition and if you like to intervene if you like to measure the uh, manage the landscape so we like to manage the soil erosion then what is the role of vegetation there okay so lots of research and 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 new understanding or new ideas you may create if you if you remember this principle of conservation of mass what is the principle input minus output of a from a from a special unit equals to the change in the storage delta st delta st now the fourth principle fourth concept is the rule of transport rule of transport the materials are transported material moves from one place to other we know according to the gradient gradient regulates the transfer of materials we give more emphasis on it only from from our say say earlier days of geomorphic understanding we we got the importance of gradient only that gradient regulates or slope regulates the transfer of materials but today we will discuss how the rheology rheology means the material property how the material property guides in the transport of materials the material which is being transported actually actually regulates how fast it will transport it will, it will move and it resistance to flow that is the boundary condition so these two are very important understanding and and uh, generally we ignore these two major factors of transport sometimes gradient is 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 not dominant at all okay if we take the example of transport of water and soil water and soil moves actually through the topographic gradient whereas a heat moves through thermal gradient you know the thermal gradient in the earth's interior thermal gradient is the major cause for all kind of kind of geotectonic activities and the chemical moves chemical that is the salinity salinity or other type of uh, chemical concentration moves according to the chemical concentration gradient where the concentration is high from that place the material moves to the place of less concentration okay now i will show you how the velocity of the movement depends upon the material property and channel roughness material property 
I am taking one example, and this example will give you the the the, the clear understanding how the material property, uh, say, say uh, regulates the movement of material. Say, if you if you see this picture, it's a mountain glacier. It's a mountain glacier. It moves down, and at its lower end, this glacier melts into water into river from where uh, a river generates. So on this slope, gradient is almost same everywhere. On this particular gradient, three kinds of materials are moving. One is ice, ice moves, water moves, then another thing, another, another one, substance, that is the wind. You know the catavitic wind, the down valley wind also blows in this environment. The mountain wind, the catavitic wind, the down valley wind moves down. So three materials, that means wind, water, and, and then ice moves on the same slope. Then which has the maximum speed? Wind has the maximum speed for movement, 100 km per hour. Whereas water moves 1 meter per second, that is 3.6 km per hour. And what is the movement of ice sheet? What is the velocity? Tens of meter per year. Tens of meter per year. So that's why the velocity differs on a single slope due to, due to the variation in the material property. Due to the variation of material property. Okay? As the material property varies, the velocity of the material, a velocity, velocity varies. Okay? Now, let us understand how the movement of water, how the downslope movement of water depends upon the resistance to flow. Resistance to flow. Those resistance are of three types: valley scale resistance, channel scale resistance, and boundary resistance. Valley scale resistance are controlled by valley morphology and confinement. Channel scale resistance are controlled by planform and bed bank roughness or stream vegetation and boundary resistance are controlled by grain and form roughness. How far, how, how, how does the, the grains, grain sizes, control the velocity, control the resistance of to flow in a channel is, is explained through this boundary resistance. Let's take one example of Chale River. Chale River, this is a small river uh, oriented in Darjeeling and Jalpaiguri districts in the mountain from uh, say, say, mountain Himalaya to the Piedmont region it extends. So it has some mountainous course and Piedmont course uh, and, and majority of it has the Piedmont course. In the mountainous region in the upper reach you see how, 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 the, uh, how, how is the condition of channel roughness water has to flow through the boulders, large boulders. That means in spite of having steep slope, the velocity is much less. Velocity of water is much less. Slope is high. This is the impelling force. Available energy is also high. But there are much resisting force. Channel bed roughness coarse fraction of sediment materials, bed materials. And that's why valley floor is relatively stable. Valley floor is relatively stable because those, those boulders are, are stable on the, on, the, on the bed because the available energy is not sufficient to move them down. Okay. That's why that's why channel bed is relatively stable as though this is armored by the boulders, cobbles and gravels. If we come to the middle course, middle course you see the boulder size or the grain size has been reduced. So resistance is reduced. Reduced channel roughness. Velocity increases. But, but what? Steepness decreases. You see, the channel is not so steep, but its velocity is more. Because, because of less roughness. Okay? Now, if you come to the lower reach, gradient is much less. It is almost, almost gentle. But velocity is very high because of, 
because of reduced resistance. Resistance is so less because of the finer particles through which it flows, its velocity is much high. Okay, so previously what we what we thought, general in our general understanding, in the mountainous course, reverse velocity is very high due to the steep slope. It is not actually true. Slope is a factor, but at the same time, resistance is also another factor. Generally, in our understanding, we, we, we ignore this factor of resistance. If we combine those two, then, then, then you will see in the mountainous course, velocity is not so much. Yeah. See, so this is the gradient. This is the gradient. Here the gradient is very, very steep near Gurubatan, near Udlabadi, which the gradient is uh, moderate and near Neura confluence, the, the gradient is much less. And you see the velocity curve. This is the water velocity. This is the surface water velocity. Yes. This is the surface water velocity. Surface water velocity much increased. Much increased. Where? Where it joins with a with a new river, Kumla Inudi. Discharge increased. River discharge increased. And as the discharge is more, all the resistance is reduced because the grain size are submerged. The, 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 the smaller grains or the bed roughness, all the roughness factors are being submerged. And that submergence caused to overcome the resistance. So if the if, if discharge of the river increases, as we know, as we know, discharge increases downstream. If we move downstream from source to mouth, there is a steady increase in the discharge in most of the rivers. What are the exceptions? Exceptions are the, are the rivers in des desert regions. If a river crosses a desert, then with increasing distance from water divide, there might be, might be reduction in the discharge. But in most of the cases, in most of the rivers, discharge increases downstream. And if you, if you get the increasing trend of the discharge, you must expect increasing trend of the velocity in downstream directions. Yeah, surface water velocity and discharge, yes. Surface water velocity and discharge. So this is how, this is how, it is the surface water velocity and this is the discharge. As the discharge increases, surface water velocity also increases. Okay. And this relationship was, was, was established by Leopold Ullmann and Miller. Leopold Ullmann and Miller in 1953. And again, it was re-established by recent findings of USGS. You see, discharge increases and water velocity increases. There is a positive relation between discharge and water velocity. What is the relationship? Yes, the factor is 0 0.3 to 0 0.6. If discharge increases downstream, channel width increases, we know this. Channel becomes wider if we move from source to mouth. Channel depth also increases, flow depth also increases. If we move from, move from source to mouth, as the discharge increases, channel depth also increases, flow depth increases. In the upper reach, upper reach, or middle reach, you can cross the river. But if you come here, you cannot cross the river. Because channel depth is so more, you will be drowned here in the, in, the, in the lower reach. In everywhere, this relationship is, is, is very prominent. That means, that means if you move from source to mouth, channel width is expected to increase downstream. Flow depth is expected to increase downstream. Even velocity of the water is expected to increase downstream. Okay? Yes. So downstream modification of channel hydraulics, channel width, flow depth, and downstream velocity 
increases with discharge and as the discharge increases downstream, so all these three are expected to increase in a downstream directions. So this is the this is the primary understanding and, and, and I think you will modify yourself in your future course of geomorphic studies. We studied the importance of boundary friction in those in this in these small streams, and we studied and we mapped those streams. Uh, we monitored the behavior of those small channels, reels, for a long time, and we monitored their velocities also. What are the velocities of the of the, of the uh, channels in a particular storm, in a particular rainfall? And what we found is in every channel. What are their lanes, gradients, uh, their, their hydraulic properties, water velocity, channel roughness, trout number, and all number, everything was calculated for a, for a particular channel. And then we found this relationship. Flow velocity is related to the roughness factors, roughness coefficient. And these relationships is more strong. Flow velocity is uh, related with slope the relationship is so weak. Flow velocity is related with width depth ratio, that is the channel geometry. Those velocity, those relationship is also weak. But which one is strong enough? Velocity is, is, is related to the roughness. As the depth of flow is less, there, the, the roughness, that is the grain size within the channel, is more prominent to control the flow velocity. So, so far, so far in most of the studies, we generally, generally, generally ignore this role of roughness, boundary frictions. But I think this is the major, major, major area of concern that we must have to concentrate upon. Okay. Now the last principle that I like to discuss with you is the geomorphic process threshold date, threshold date nature of geomorphic process. The geomorphic processes like river, wind, or glaciers, they don't erode every day, they don't work every day, they don't bring the change in the landscape every day. But after crossing a threshold velocity or threshold energy, a threshold condition, critical condition, they start working. So this is the fundamental that we have to understand, and this is the this is the major areas of uh, process studies that we must incorporate in our future explanations and future studies. How important this concept is? I took one example of bank erosion. In a Sundargon area, it's a, it's a small moja near the Raimangal River. That is Hemnagar moja in Hingolganj block. Here, Raimangal River frequently erodes the embankments, erodes its banks. And this is where the embankment or the river bank was situated in the year 2003. This is where it was situated in 2006. This is where it was situated in 2009. So this is how this is how the river shifts and bank shifting, bank, bank shifting occurs, erosion occurs, bank erosion occurs. Now, if you have this data with you, during 2003 to 2009, within these six years, bank erosion occurred by, by 180 meter. Now easily we can calculate the rate of erosion per year, 30 meter per year. Is it right? Is it a right conclusion? Whether this conclusion is, is, is effective or whether, whether this conclusion is uh, how far how far this conclusion is a correct one let's let's take the proper picture with continuous study this information is available in the year 2003 in the month of september there was an erosion of 50 meter 
by two erosion during spring tide. In the year 2006, between 6th to 13th July, due to depression and heavy rain, there was two erosion and it caused an erosion of 100 meters. And in 2009, on the day of Paila 25th May, there was overtopping and that event caused an erosion of 30 meters. Now, what's the difference between this understanding and this understanding? Here, 30 meter per year and here 30 meter on a particular day or, a, or, a, or within few hours of a day. 100 meter within six days and 50 meter on a particular event. So now you can understand the difference between our traditional approach of of, of equal rate of erosion, average rate of erosion. There should be no average working or equal distribution of working of any geomorphic process. You couldn't, you should not calculate the average rate of erosion because those erosion event is not distributed equally over a time frame, but those are episodic. With one particular episode, this process of erosion is concentrated. So we must go for episodic understanding of episodic erosions. Erosion concentrates with a particular episode which crossed its geomorphic threshold. Which crossed the geomorphic threshold is able to perform erosion, perform major change in the landscape. So here lies the importance of importance of geomorphic threshold. So from henceforth, you shouldn't calculate any average rate. It is, it is, it is not uh, true at all. If we take another example of debris slide, so this is how one, one, one debris slide is changed from, in, from different years, uh, February 2002, 2000, uh, October 2000. And these are, these are uh, say monitored. In 2001, it was 2004 and 2004 September. So this is how, this is how the entire, entire slide, debris slide or landslide uh, has been extended. So these were plotted. It was the first profile, it's the second profile, third profile, fourth profile, and fifth profile. Okay. Now the length of the debug, length of the landslide during 2000 and 2004 has been increased by 16 meter. Its length was 16 meter in 2000, and in 2004 it was 32 meter. And during these four years, it has been extended by 16 years. So you can easily calculate the average rate of slope extension four meter per year. That means slope retreat. It's a popular concept of slope retreat, rate of slope retreat. You can calculate what is the rate of average rate of slope retreat four meter per year. But what is the actual case? In the year 2000, on 26th June, there was a landslide and, and on this landslide, slope retreat was 4.15 meter. In the year 2000, on 10th June, 2.15 meter. In the year 2003, 23rd June, it was 6.10 meter and it was 3.60 meter on 2004, 3rd June. That means these are the episodic events. These Landslide event is, is a event of a moment. It occurs in a moment. It is not distributed over the, over the, over the entire year. So this understanding four meter per year and 6.10 meter per in, in a single day within few seconds 
is quite different. And that's why your understanding or your findings couldn't be used for planning purposes. And until and unless, until and unless you could understand this, you may not, you cannot effectively plan for slope management or solution or landslide management. So that's why it is much important to understand the thresholded nature of the geomorphic process. Geomorphic process is thresholded. So this concept, I am not uh, uh, coming into the details of this conceptual development. Up to the age of Bible, in the age of Bible, there was the concept of catastrophism. Most of the geomorphologists and scientists, they believe in the, in the, in the uh, catastrophism and they believe all the landscapes of the world are developed within 40 days of Noah's flood. Earth was created suddenly by the wish of God, by the wish of God, God within six days, which was noted in Bible. And most of the geomorphologists and physical scientists, they believe in this idea of catastrophism. But James Hutton, Playfair and Loyal, they proposed uniformitarianism. That means the river valley that you see recently is not created suddenly but it is created gradually by continuous evolution. This is the principle of uniformitarianism. Okay? But now what we understood that this, there is a requirement of modification of this principle of, modification of this principle of uniformitarianism. In the name of duocatastrophism, that means the river valley that we see today is not cut every day, but is cut by the different episodes of storms or floods which crossed the thresholds, energy thresholds required for, for, for erosion. If the threshold energy, critical energy is, is, is available, then only then only erosion starts. For a particular grain within a river valley, in the valley bottom, may not move downstream until and unless there is a critical energy is available. So after exceeding a critical or boundary condition, sudden or vast changes occur. That means the processes are not equally distributed over the time frame. The processes are not equally distributed over the time frame, but those are thresholded. What are the examples? Volcanic activities, earthquakes, landslides, flood, and all the geomorphic processes. They operate after achieving a threshold conditions. Okay? So, this understanding of the, the, the geomorphic threshold conditions are applied for explaining entrainment and transport by a river after achieving critical shear stress. Slope failure after achieving critical height and stiffness, slope landslide occurs. Okay? Large and rare events, say large floods, which are very rare, they, they, they transfer they, they, uh, transfer the valley or they, they change the valley more than day-to-day -day events. Okay. So to understand uh, the threshold geometric parameters for changing a laminar flow to turbulent flow, we made small uh, on, on, on a small experiment. The threshold stage for entrainment. Say this was a channel. This was a channel. Actually, it was a natural channel. We constructed this part for our experiment, and it was their distribution of widths. These are the distribution of widths, and for under, for our better understanding or for within the experiment, we constructed this channel by placing boulders on it. So this was the original width of 1.4 meter and, and, and 
we transfer it into 0.43 meter with a width depth of 10 and 3.58. Okay, width depth ratio. You see, in the original setup, the flow was tranquil, flow was laminar, and river has only the capacity to transport. River has only the capacity to transport. There was no capacity for capacity for erosion. Okay. Now you see after yes. after the restrict after the constriction of the channel by putting the boulders, this laminar flow is transferred into the turbulent flow. Yes, this turbulent surface. Okay, and as the as the hydraulic character or or, or uh, hydraulic geometry has been changed, then entire property of this entire process uh, of the uh, operations of the of the channel or river has been changed. So this was the median grain size. It is previous velocity. It is altered velocity. It was the gradient. This was the previous depth, and it is the altered depth. And with those parameters, you can easily calculate the critical bed, my bed shear stays available under previous conditions. And it is now, what is the critical bed shear stays available in the altered condition. If you put your result within this velocity curve, velocity and, and grid, uh, grid size curve, that is the Hallstrom curve, then you see, it was the original position of the valley which has only transportation capacity. And now under the altered condition, the situation has been changed and this channel is transferred into an erosional channel. And see how it erodes. Yes, there is the erosion, it erodes, it starts eroding. And those eroded materials are extended downstream more and more as the condition prevails. So this is how, this is how the threshold condition has been changed. One threshold has been achieved to change its flow condition from laminate to turbulent. And that's why the erosional threshold has been achieved. Okay? And if you can understand the threshold condition for a particular setup of geomorphic process, it will help the environmental planners or engineers to concentrate on a particular locality and particular situation better than what the general understanding we have presently. And we can make these geomorph geomorphological studies more applied and more socially relevant if we can calculate those threshold conditions, even specific conditions. Okay. Now, I like to conclude my today's discussion that if you like to design your research, what would be its special dimension, what would be the study area, and what would be the time frame, your first concept of scale dependency has to be understood. And if you like to select the method of investigation, then your understanding of two-way relationship of form and processes are very important. Process regulates the form, and at the same time, form regulates the working of the processes. So these kind of two-way relationships are very important to understand the self-regulatory nature of the landscape. And your explanation in the geomorphic research should be more scientifically rigorous. And this should be based on these key concepts. And if you are guided by these key concepts, and if you use those scientific languages that we discussed today, your explanation would be more rigorous, more scientific, and more, 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 more accepted by the, by the international communities international communities of geomorphologists or physical geographers. 
and i like to request you for going for continuous monitoring and it will help you to identify the thresholds continuous monitoring of the geomorphic processes in most of the cases we the geomorphologists never concentrate on the processes but we concentrate on the geomorphic patterns that you can easily easily identify from the imageries or from the maps from the topographical maps we concentrate our 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 studies on those patterns which are registered on the maps or imageries but never we we give much our much of our effort to understand the processes but if you are ready to understand the processes then i will request you to go for continuous monitoring to find the geomorphic thresholds and you have to go for event specific studies okay and i like to acknowledge uh, the financial institutes uh, the, the, the 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 institutes like ugc dst and icss for their financial contribution in the researches that i carried on and i i incorporated in this talk today and my uh, scholars and co-workers who worked with me have given me enough academic and logistic support and i like to acknowledge their 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 uh, support and help so thank you very much thank you uh, the organizers mainly shubhadeep and shayani and the college authority who have given me this platform for sharing my understanding on on these very crucial and fundamental issues of geomorphology so thank you very much thank you thank you sir sir you have showed us a fabulous presentation especially i want to mention uh the last part of your presentation from the very beginning to uh, at the end you have go through the different experimental studies example of experimental studies field studies not only the theoretical knowledge so that is i think uh, we should uh, convey the thank of what you have present in front of us uh, in front of us that uh, field geomorphology how it is important uh, at, at each and every moment of study of geography uh, we have some questions we have some questions from our students also sir we will we can discuss uh, we can share those in front of us devosuti devosuti can you share the questions from our students yes sir yes sir actually there are so many questions uh, from st student side but uh, due to time crunch we have selected fewer ones sir uh there's a question from uh, shudeep day pg semester 1 uh he was asking that sir with the process based geomorphology uh can we construct models for predicting long term changes in landforms over human time scales yeah it's a very good question actually prediction we generally do because of planning purpose and if you see that a geomorphic process operation of geomorphic process and development of landforms are related to the working or interrelationships of numbers of factors those factors are liable to change at every moment and if one factor change then entire systematic relationship changes that means in long term your prediction may not be true so better better to rely on short term predictions say 10 years after 10 years or after 20 years what is expected because the changes are related to thresholds at every time threshold conditions are also changing okay so the system is so dynamic and so complex and and then depending upon upon so many factors that this dynamicity and complexities and their 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 reliability of the models are are uh, say say are questionable but yet we have to go for predictions because the predictions helps us for in monitoring and better explanation uh, depends upon the rigorous prediction the accurate predictions 
and it is the use of science today if you can predict the future better then you can prepare better for the future situations so prediction is a very important part of geomorphology and science today but we have to be very careful because we are dealing with a very very delicate uh, part of the systems earth science systems where every time there is the 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 the, the uh, possibility of dynamism okay thank you uh the question from the same student um for protection of entire downstream hydraulics of a stream uh can we need to build up the same strategy as integrated drainage uh, basin management for river and erosional protection see erosion or process uh, actually for effective management of bank erosion or river erosion we must know the working of a river we have to know we have to understand the river better which in which boundary condition river is working there are two types of boundary condition one is the static boundary condition or imposed boundary condition that is the geology lithology confinement pattern of the channels on which river is working and there is flux boundary conditions that is the that is the sediment and and discharge flux which are constantly changing in which condition river is working and what is the pattern of change what is the nature of change as as we move downstream okay so this understanding rigorous understanding is very essential and in most of the cases frankly speaking this understanding is lacking behind behind planning one 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 say engineering structures or structural measures for 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 effective uh, erosion management so here lies the importance of the process geomorphologist not the text of geomorphologists who who uh, rely on the satellite imagery mostly we need to understand how the river process how the river works and what is the change of this process or working of the rivers in in long term with climate change fluxes or with other changing situations how river itself change its behavior that understanding is very important for effective management of a of a, of a bank erosion or other or say flood management bank erosion or channel shifting there are lots of problems associated to the fluvial processes but we have to know the river better and that's why we require a rigorous studies on the processes fluvial processes so okay. it is connection between the yeah. form process relationship yeah yeah that one is very important that one is very important and we never give importance to understand the process because it is it is it is uh, laborious it is difficult to do it's a very difficult to do and it requires continuous monitoring and you have to spend years on the bank of the river that's why you will avoid it but it's the time of the it's a, it's a very it's a, it's a time it's a requirement of the time uh, need of the time that 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 we must put emphasis on it because most of the, our rivers are becoming so dynamic and they are they are either deteriorated or they lost their uh, water handling capacity or they becoming they are becoming flood, flood prone flood contours are becoming in where they are increased and most of the rivers are being silted up so there are lots of problems in south bengal rivers and and then uh, there is a threat of climate change and uh, says increasing intensity of rainfall and storms so in this condition in this juncture uh, i think we the geomorphologists have to think in a different line and our entire research and the programs are to be oriented in a different line okay, satellite imagery is very important and it gives us a understanding 
prior understanding of the processes. It, it gives us the very good, the special, uh, say, say, uh, uh, understanding of the, of the patterns. How the Elevated patterns. information, something yeah. elevated information. Okay. So these are very important, important tool with us. But we should concentrate in understanding the processes. Sir, one of our uh, students asked that we have a common friend to uh, work with the change detection of the coastline or the bank line of river uh, from the satellite image in decadal manner. So uh, you have uh, discussed that that should not be a right way to do. Then what to do, sir? No, no, change detection we have to do. We can, we can understand in which way, what is the trend of the change and what is the what is the line of uh, say, say, uh, in in the line in which river has a tendency to change, sir? Uh, I think. Uh, but, but, but 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 we must understand why there is this change. Total erosion divided by number of years is not the solution. Yeah, it it's not the it, it is not the solution. Why the river is changing, and and. The decadal, it should not be the decadal one. It should be event specific. Even in specific. which storm and which cyclone there was erosion. In, in case of, in case of uh, coastal uh, coast, it should be cyclone specific. In case of bank erosion, it should be flood specific, flood event specific. It should not be decadal one. It should not be decadal one. If you bring this decade Set equal temporal frame, the entire event has been lost. Okay, the original event has been lost. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question from uh, semester two PG department. The question is uh, for developing a riverine ecosystem and tourism, how much it would be beneficial for sustainable tourism development in Shobhujdeep, Devulti, Noyachor, and Purvostholi, or like more which are upcoming? It's a very <laughs> tricky question. It's a tricky question. It's a very interesting question. Yeah. The, again, I like to uh, put stress on understanding the river and how we are trying to implement it our planning, we are trying to implement it. Whether we are uh, constructing embankment to restrict the flood waters or, or the saline water, and in which way we are, we are executing the plans. These are very important. If we don't interrupt the working of the estuarine process much, then these kind of initiatives are welcomed because it will give you much avenues for, for employment generation and recreation. And it will give the, the, the avenues for our students to visit those places also, to understand the nature better. So these are, these are welcomed, these will be welcomed if there is not too much interruption in the, in the, in the uh, say, say, working of estuarine processes or fluvial processes. So it depends, it depends. So the prime thing is we have to know the process better prior to prior to planning or, or we have to incorporate the geomorphologists who know the process better into the planning boards. Okay, sir. Uh, there's another question. Um, how much the chor or micro islands are prone to bank erosion or flood prone in the lower Gangetic plain? Yeah, yeah. Say, I think the answer of this question, uh, it, it's a very, very good question on the uh, process geomorphology. I think you know, how does a straight channel transfers into the braided channels? So there is a mechanism. If there is any way, the starting of flow separations, if there is any barrier within the channel, if any barrier starts, then flow separation occurs. And at the place of flow separation, the chores or this kind of 
say say mid channel bars are developed and as there is more and more deposition within the channel river requires the accommodation space of for water and then it pushes towards the bank and bank erosion starts if there is more deposition within the channel there will be more lateral erosion because river has to create its space for 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 accommodation of water for movement of water so these two things are correlated and you, you should not say 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 try to artificially uh, stabilize those uh, chores before its maturation or maturity and if you see for the last 50 years or 100 years these chores are uh, continuously uh, increasing in area and you have to identify its most mature part where sediment is much compacted then only in those areas you can you can set up your human intervention but the judicial suggestion is not to disturb the premature islands Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir, sir, a question from Shantanu Banerji, PGCM four. As sir said that the velocity of a river is less in the upper catchment for the resistance force. Is the change in gradient only the reason uh, for the deposition of sediment or the erosion of the sediment? Actually, things are not unidirectional. The velocity depends upon lots of factors, not a single factor. So far, we. I mean, in our textbooks and popular books, popular writings, it was taken to be unidirectional and being controlled by the gradient only. Here lies the problem: the velocity depends upon discharge, boundary friction, that is the grain size and slope, and these are three major factors which control the velocity of water. And if you take proper, uh, say, say, say. Uh, important if you give proper importance into these three factors then you can identify its relation where the velocity would be more where the velocity would be less so you have to incorporate all these three factors together not the single factor of the gradient that's why much of our understanding is erroneous and our 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 explanations are not so 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 acceptable and this understanding has been available is available since 1953 but surprisingly our students didn't get into this understanding because of the failure of us we couldn't we are not able to bring this understanding into into the general forum general general students for the have to, understanding for the betterment of understanding we generally uh, say this, there is to uh, by linear relationship between the two very no, yeah, it's not it's not no true. linear relationship is there yeah and only only it was guided by the way it was every every where we we have a general understanding that velocity is proportional to the slope with steep slope velocity would be high that's why it is expected that river has high velocity in mountains no it's it's not true it's not true we you have mentioned to, like, uh, yeah, the road of the in the roughness factor yes we have to rectify ourselves and it is our fault that we are we, 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 we it is our failure that we couldn't bring the right thing to our students but it was available uh, after the after the uh, say, say publication of the book by leopold ulmen and miller yes Um, there is another question, sir. Actually, these are not from the uh, riverine part, but uh, students uh, from the semester four they were asking about uh, another question. That is, uh, why is the value of the uh, Richter scale not more than ten oh, in measuring the earthquakes? <laughs> Actually, these scales are relative scales. these scales are relative scales these are not the absolute measurement these are not based on the absolute measurement if you see the richter scales and their definitive descriptions you see 
the magnitude of destructions are related to these scales. Okay, these are all the relative scales. And these are those are related to the magnitude of destruction. The highest level of destruction means the Richter scale 10. That's why the, how, how we uh, say, say, set the uh, Likert scales. Highest level of satisfaction, 10. Lowest level of dissatisfaction, 0 or, or 1. So in the, these are the relative kind of scales. And we have, and these are, these are uh, used for the uh, description of a intensity of hazards and intensity of destructions. Okay, these are the relative scales here. Yeah. Uh, SG? Um, there is a question from Vansika Jadav. Have you asked this? No, no, no. Vansika uh, Jadav, we, uh, she asked, sir, uh, sir, how simulation modeling and process from hemophilic integration is helpful is understanding for the evolution of landform. Yeah, simulation modeling is very important. And actually, you know the models. Models are the very specific, are very, and, and uh, very specific part of a theory. Actually, theory means our understanding of process from relationships and, and, and say, interactions among the different factors. And it's a, it's a very simple way of relationship that is represented within a simulation model. We take entire system closed, peripheral system closed, and only working of the process, working of the of the, of the uh, factors, interworking of those factors are uh, open. And then in that premises, we prepare a simulation model, keeping all the peripheral factors closed, keeping all the peripheral factors constant. Okay. But always those result of the simulation model may not be actually applicable to the, to the real field. Because those models are the very, 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 uh, say, say, specific, uh, it, it represents a specific use of a theory. If you go to the real field, the things may be different. But this simulation model helps us for the, for, 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 interworking of the processes or the working of the systems or having a fundamental understanding of the systems and these are these are very useful and sometimes among the numbers of factors you could identify some factors as dominant then you like to understand how those factors are operating in such conditions simulation model is very important very important so process for, for understanding process form relationships in, in say coastal areas, in say fluvial areas, in bank erosions, those kind of simulation modeling is very important. Very important. Even, even in the in the in the uh, flux of sediments, the simulation, lots of simulation models are there, and these are very important also. And these are important for having a fundamental understanding of the processes. Okay. But in the real field, things are more complex. Sir, you have uh, said about the miniature model uh, on field yeah. Yeah. in nature. So, yeah. uh, what is what what is more important? Yeah, uh, miniature Actually, model yeah. on table or miniature model in nature? Yeah, miniature model in nature is more important because it operates under under the natural conditions. You are only altering one component. And you see how how the things, how the process are operating under the natural conditions. And there is no need for uh, setting the controls. Okay, if you operate or if you see how the things are operating, how the process are operating under the natural setup, then it would be more realistic than the simulations. There is no need for extra validation. If you yeah, go, yeah, go yeah. for the uh, nature model, there is no need for there is no need for validation because because the pictures and the videography they 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 uh, say captures the real uh, real real things. Actual, actual things. Yeah, actual things. 
Okay. Uh, so, is there any specific time uh, duration for a specific day or specific hours? How, how long it can be uh, taken as study? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Very good question. That depends upon your objective. That depends upon your objective. Say if you like to understand the mechanism of bank erosion, mechanism of bank erosion, then if you if you if you see that both the internal processes, all the factors which are expected to work are captured, then you can stop at any time. And it depends upon your expectation. Say yes, I, I could understand the total process. Actually, what is the importance of the miniature forms? The rivers are so large in nature that you cannot observe it. We see a part of it only. We could observe a part of it. But if you take if we take a miniature scale landscape, plots, then the entire things are brought into a smaller scale and you can see the operations over an entire scale. Then you can upscale it. You can easily upscale for a for a uh, upscale this experience for a larger, larger areas. There might be some more uh, complexity in larger scales, but the fundamental process remains the same. Fundamental process remains the same. So when you go for the threshold uh, study, like uh, erosional threshold study, what you have uh, shown in your slides and the video, uh, so uh, that that might be the potassium permanganate. But yeah, 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 yeah. That is so, the that is the dye tracing, dye tracer. Right. Yes. So by doing this, we can go for the easy understanding of the fluvial processes. Yeah, yeah, of course. But it should be the small river. In case of large river, you require huge amount of dyes, but that is not actually possible. So for small river and hilly streams and torrential streams, this technique is very important. Uh, so another question is on the basis of the percentage of sand, silt, and clay, how density of sediment deposits changes respect to the time. Application of logarithmic scale to evaluate the influence can be applied here. From this question from fourth sem UG. Mm. Well, it's a it's a very complicated question, isn't it? Okay, so percentage of clay, sand, and silt. Depends upon lots of factors, mainly the energy availability. Energy, it reflects the process. Actually, like your history book, in every page, there are lots of information hidden. And these sedimentary layers, they, they hide lots of stories within it through those percentages of sand, clay, and silt. You can you can easily say, say go for sieving and you can go for the, the sediment analysis techniques, their pattern of shorting, their pattern of and, and their textural class distribution, and it gives a very interesting story. Textural variation. Yeah, textural variation. If you see one layer having much sand kosher scent. And if you see the fragments in, in under microscope, if you see they are, they are say, say, angular in nature, that means after their weathering, they didn't cross lots of distance, but they are of local origin and they were deposited in a, in a storms with, with, with huge energy. It, it, it may uh, disclose an event of flood. But in the next layer, you may see a very fine, finer particles where the uh, percentage of silt and clay is high. That regulates or that shows the, shows the calm situations. Where, where the level of energy is less. Okay, if you if you carry on analyzing these phases, sequence of phases for a long time, you must have 
some clue in the magnitude frequency of the processes. So some amount of flood or some amount of discharge is available after 50 years or after 25 years in a river. And you must have, a, have such kind of sequences. So lots of things you can, you can, you can do with the sediment analysis, but don't uh, give only importance to logarithmic distributions. Logarithmic distribution is a way to represent it. Why log is used? If the grain sizes differ hugely, then only we have to bring the logarithmic scale to compress the data. To compress the data. Okay, with a logarithmic scale, we can we can accommodate say single digit data and say cores or or 10 to the power 7, 8, 9, 10 together within a single frame. So this is the use of logarithm only. Nothing else. The representation of the data is different thing, but yeah. Yeah. the sedimentological analysis has a very broad aspect in awesome. river science. Awesome. Yeah. Logarithmic logarithmic distribution has only the aim to accommodate huge variations in the data. It can accommodate the single digit data. At the same time, it can accommodate 10 to the power 7, 10, 8, 9, 10 data together. So this is only the use of logarithmic distribution. Nothing else. So sedimentological analysis has the aim to disclose the history which is hidden with those sediments. History which, have, of which have no data yeah. of uh, yeah. record. Yeah. So, 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 History of what? History of processes. The then processes, when it was deposited. Yeah. Um, I think uh, there's a question in uh, fourth semester group. Can you see and mention the question? Honestly. Yes. Um, can classical geomorphological concepts such as planification or retrogressive erosion be quantitatively understood? <laughs> it's again a tricky question. It's a very interesting question. Yeah. Periplanation or periplanation is a long-term process. It spreads over millions of years of time scale. So we couldn't have any method to understand such a long period of evolution. Okay, it's only a theoretical understanding. It's only a theoretical model. And some end features that we could identify from different parts of the world may be taken as an instance of the end product of this process. It's all only. From this, we can deduce which was earlier. So those deduction process of deduction was used to explain the landscape history. But never, nobody has seen the entire process of evolution from youth to maturity and up to, up to the world. Because it's a long-term process. It could not be quantitatively, quantitatively deduced, but there might be some softwares which could, which could uh, reduce the time frame or which could fasten the processes. That might be done. Lots of things could be done by computation technologies. But in actual, actual understanding, it's a long time scale process which covers millions of years or hundreds of millions of years. That is not uh, possible to quantify. That is, that is not possible to, 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 to understand uh, within a short period of time. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words and deliberation, what you have presented in front of us. You have presented a lot regarding field geomorphology, model study, change in fluvial dynamics, experimental study. Uh, certainly, uh, we and our students have learned a lot from you. And uh, we request you to continue the process in future. You should be with us uh, whenever is possible. Uh, so now the time for me to... Uh, request our head of the department, uh, Dr. Shurav Dash, uh, to say a few words.
uh, on behalf of our department and for vote of thanks also. Show them Okay. Thank you, Sumodhi. Uh, thank you, uh, Ramkrishna. A very nice uh, lecture uh, on key concept in geomorphology. So um, now the time to give vote of thanks. So respected vice principal, sir, respected barsa, sir. IQSC coordinator, madam, uh, honorable invited guest speaker, dear research scholars, my dear colleagues, and my dear my dear present, as well as the few ex students. We have reached at the end of the program. I feel honored and privileged to having an opportunity to offer a vote of thanks in this program. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our vice principal, sir, Professor Apurva Ray to give us the permissions to arrange this program. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our invited guest speaker, Professor Ramkrishna Maiti, for delivering his outstanding lecture on Key's concept in geomorphology. I mention our deep sense of appreciation for his explanation and demonstration of this topic and sharing his knowledge and huge experience with us. Thank you so much, sir. We are very much thankful that to accept our invitation. I also express my thanks to all the participants who are gathered here through online in a virtual platform to attend this program. Without your participations, this program would not have been successful. Thank you so much for paying your valuable attention and also suggesting with your uh, good questions as well as some opinions. Finally, I would like to give a word of thanks to all the faculty members of our department all the supporting staffs, including the IT sections, and all the students for their cooperations to make this program successful. Thank you so much. Have a nice day, everyone. Over to Shuvatip. So thank you. Uh, thank you, so much. Uh, from from core of my heart, I am I am I am extending my thanks to you, Shuvatip, Shani, uh, Shurov, Devushmiti. And and uh, the college authority also, so uh, it's it's a pleasure experience for me because the questions from the audience from the students were so very good questions, very good, good. so so good. Uh, uh, it it uh, so say I I was quite surprised yeah. at the level of understanding they have, yeah. their level of understanding. So best wishes to the students, and if you continue in this way. You will be a better geomorphologist and better scientist than us. Okay. So with these best wishes, I I I, I am uh, say say uh, taking your permission to leave. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Madam, will you want to say few words at the end, Madam Shanidi? Madam. Yes, Madam. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much from our end for your time deliberation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.